the difficulty I have with both of those approaches, and, and Becker's is the taste for discrimination approach. In today's episode of Mixtape the Podcast, I have the pleasure of introducing a very interesting economist named William Darity, or Sandy Darity, as he often goes by. Dr. Darity is the Samuel Dubois Professor of Public Policy at Duke Sanford School, and he's one of the more original economists I've had the pleasure of reading and talking to in a very long time. One of my favorite sayings is by the statistician George Box, who said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. It reminds me that I should hold my beliefs with an open hand and not a clenched fist and be willing to let things go when they stop being useful to me. Dr. Darity embodies to me some of that wisdom if only for his willingness to consider that there may be alternative ways of doing economics that are just as useful, if not more so, than the ones we repeat to ourselves and to others. In this interview, we're going to discuss uh, Dr. Darity's work he's done on stratification economics, the role that personal identification with groups play in inequality, reparations for slavery, growing up in the Middle East, and maybe one of the most controversial life choices that a person can make working for Duke University as a lifelong obsessive fan of the um, Chapel Hill Tar Heels basketball program. As always, I am your host, Scott Cunningham, and this is Mixtape, the podcast. Okay. So I have here with me Dr. S Sandy Darity, goes by Sandy, uh, the Samuel Dubois Professor of Public Policy at Duke's Sanford School. Uh, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's been a hard week for you, right? Because first Duke is uh, in the Final Four with... Uh, with well, no, 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 no. I, 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 I teach at Duke, but I am a Carolina fan to the yeah. bone. That's what I thought. So, I thought well, so, was, so, so more or less, it's been actually a pretty good week, even if yeah. they lost in the final even game. They lost. Yeah. Okay, so it was a bit of a roller coaster then. So you, they they, beat, <laughs> they beat, your, beat your employer and then lose at the end. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really but nice. but 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 they have bragging rights for eternity. Yeah, exactly. They say goodbye. <laughs> they say goodbye to Coach K and uh, uh, send him send him on his way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, I wanted to just sort of start off and um, hear a little bit about your uh, your early life. So you you I, when we were talking uh, just a minute ago, uh, I had thought maybe you grew up in Virginia, but you told me that's not true. I was just, just wanted to hear a little bit about your your early life. Yeah, and 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 my my early biography also explains why I'm a Carolina fan. But that yeah. that's that that's that's the story I'm glad to share. So. Um, <laughs> I was born in Virginia, but when I was uh, because my, my my parents were 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 living there, working there, although they both are originally from North Carolina uh, and, and both of my parents uh, went to undergraduate school in North Carolina. My my father went to Shaw University and my mother went to Barber Scotia College uh, in, in Concord, North Carolina. Uh, but they were working in Virginia at the point at which I was born. And so I, I really only lived in Virginia for maybe the first six months of my life. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, my, my father took a job with the World Health Organization. And so we moved to the Middle East. Wow. And so for the first eight years of my life, we lived uh, in Lebanon and then in Egypt. And my younger sister actually was born in Beirut, Lebanon. So... Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, uh, so there, there was not any kind of sustained period of time where I lived in Virginia. Uh, we came back to the United States when I was eight years of age, uh, and I, I entered fourth grade at Glenwood Elementary in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was one of only two black kids at the school. So effectively the two of us desegregated the school. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's another story. But uh, my, my father, we, we came back to the United States because my father uh, had enrolled in a PhD program in public health at the University of North Carolina. Mm. 
And uh, so that's that's why I'm a North Carolina basketball fan, because since the time I was eight years of age, I was attached to uh, to to uh, to that institution because that's where my father did his PhD. So, yeah. So, you have so I've been a Carolina fan for 60 years. Yeah, yeah. So, that's, that's, uh, that's and, great. And, and, and I, I couldn't I couldn't reverse that when I uh, when I took a job at Duke. Yeah, they don't they don't make you make take like a pledge or something. No, there's no blood oath. I'm <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> that would have been like a deal breaker. Uh, so, yeah. Well, so so, so, so much as uh, you know, much as I can, I can say positive things about Duke, particularly uh, with respect to some of the initiatives that I've wanted to pursue. Um, yeah, I I still can't bring myself to uh, to support Duke basketball. Yeah, yeah, sure, I understand that. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you have a lot of memories from Lebanon then? Is that something that's vivid at all? Uh, I have more vivid memories, obviously, from, from, uh, living in Alexandria, Egypt than I do in Lebanon. Oh, we, were in Lebanon. Yeah. we were in Lebanon for the first five years of my life and then in Egypt for the next three. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but I do have images and recollections, um, and, uh, uh you know, I, I, I'm convinced <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm convinced that it's uh, in in uh, in Beirut where I first had a fish that they what they, they call it, but Baranzino or something like that huh? is some kind of Mediterranean sea bass. It's it's the best tasting fish of all, and uh, and and I had some as a child, and I never had any fish that tasted like that again until I was in a restaurant and and tried Baranzino, oh, and wow. I said. Oh, it must be the same fish because yeah. uh, it, it's fabulous. Yeah. Oh. Um, I also have recollections of, of of being driven up into the mountains uh, uh, around Beirut and seeing the trees that they call the cedars, the cedars of Lebanon, and they they were uh, they were gorgeous. Uh, so I do have some recollections there. Uh, the negative recollection is the onset of the uh, of of a civil war in in uh, in Lebanon. Uh, where uh, my father arranged to get us out of the country and move to Egypt before it was time for him to start his uh, his term of service there. Uh, so he stayed in Lebanon, and uh, you know we were very very concerned that 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 he might he might not uh, we might not see him again. But he wow. he uh, uh, he managed to survive and and joined us in Egypt. And so, oh. um, so, you know, maybe the most significant recollection I have from that phase of my life that's relevant to my work is uh, living in Alexandria, Egypt, which is a coastal city uh, where uh, the, 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 the social system of stratification is evident as you go up the beachfront. Mm -hmm. So uh, the beach is along what's called the Corniche, and um, at the, at the uh, far end of the beach is the the palace that was the former home of King Farouk before he was ousted uh, by uh, by a, a group of uh, a group of uh, soldiers, off, military officers led by uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, before he was ousted, he lived in this really uh, elaborate, elaborate palace that's on the far end of the Corniche. Mm. And uh, as you move from the lower end of the Corniche to the far end, uh, the, the beachfront becomes uh, more elegant. Mm. Uh, you know, the, 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 the beach is cleaner, it's less crowded. And so what I learned very early, because, uh, because we had friends who were at all tiers of, 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 of Egyptian society, mm -hmm. what I learned very early was that the poorest Egyptians went to the beach, for the, the portion of the beach that was furthest from the palace. Mm -hmm. And as uh, individuals became more affluent, <laughs> they would migrate up the beach uh, mm -hmm. so that the, the richest Egyptians were on the portions of the beach that were adjacent to the palace, wow. and so uh, so you could actually look at the 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 composition or the demography of the of the folks who were on the on the beach 
and actually gauge uh, their class position in Egyptian society. Mm. Um, now, I didn't have that language at that time, right. but I certainly did have a sense that folks at the low end of the beach were the poorest right. and folks at the upper end of the beach were the richest. Right. And it began to really trigger questions in my mind about, well, you know, why is this the case? Yeah. Why, why do some people have so much more than others? And why do others have so much less yeah. than, the, than the rest? And so, yeah. um, so that, that was kind of the beginning, I guess, in a way. That was the beginning of stratification economics for yeah. me. Well, so it, when you were attracted to economics, uh, were those the kinds of conversations that you heard in the history of the field at the, like, were those kind of, what, what was it, what were the sorts of questions and debates that you were interacting with at the beginning that kind of drew you into economics? So um, I, I drew, I was drawn into economics because I had an expectation that this would be the subject matter or one of the core subject matters of the field. Mm. Uh, I went to Brown university as an undergraduate and um you know, at the time, in some sense, Brown's economics department was uh, a bit of a knockoff from the University of Chicago. And so actually wasn't uh, much attention given to these kinds of issues in a way that made sense to me. When you say uh, it's a knockoff, you mean sort of that, uh, the, like the, 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 the Becker Kind of the, the style of the that? department, the, the, the type of research people were, were doing. Uh, it was very similar, I think, in 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 terms of the. It was very similar to the type of research that was emerging out of a out of a University of Chicago. Yeah, uh, that's not to say that everybody was kind of a free market acolyte, but right. Uh, right. but but I think most of the faculty members were definitely, you know, very much mainstream economists. Uh -huh. And uh, only, you know, only one of them, Herschel Grossman, really had any kind of serious consideration of Keynesianism. Right. So, uh, you know, you know, in that sense, you know, I, I, I don't know, for want of a better term, it was a, it was a fairly orthodox economics department. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, there was a visiting visiting professor who was, who, who was uh, British, who taught a class in urban economics uh, that, was, that was fantastic and was closer to the spirit of the kinds of uh, concerns that I had. Uh, and so uh, I really, you know, appreciated that, but that was, that was unusual. Yeah. Uh, and I, I became increasingly convinced that if you wanted to understand poverty and inequality, uh, you know, the conventional ways in which economists think about it not, are not particularly helpful. Well, what's the shortcoming of that, of the, the, the thing you're describing in, within economics that, that has held it back? Or that, is, it, is it the frameworks or is it the people that have held back the study of poverty and inequality within economics? Well, it's, 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 it's the theoretical framework to a large degree, but it's also the fact that most of the people who join the economics field don't really challenge that theoretical framework. Mm. They, they, they accept it, uh, you know, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I mean, and the, the basic way in which economists explain why some people are rich and some are poor is by saying, well, you know, you get a higher income if you have more human capital. Right. Or if you have a better quality of human capital, right. and so these disparities uh, are really due to deficiencies that the yeah. folks at the lower end of the dis distribution have. Yeah, uh, and and that's a story that I think uh, is is really superficial. Yeah, so it seems like I, I when I was kind of been preparing for the interview, I was thinking to myself, you know, Dr. Darity is has been in this. Uh, I mean, I don't know exactly how to say this, but it seems like you've been in a uh, conversation with Gary Becker for almost for a long time. Is that is that is that accurate at all? Because of the because even what you just said just then about human capital and then also uh, your stratification economics view of, of discrimination, it, it does not even seem to be built on that Beckerian framework. And so I guess I'll, it almost just seems like there's been a bit of a debate. 
Well, you know, uh, you know, far be it for me to uh, to be presumptuous enough to say that I'm debating with a, a, a deceased uh, Nobel laureate, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, one of the earliest papers that I ever did, which was my senior honors thesis at Brown, which ultimately got published in the Review of Black Political Economy, mm. was the critical examination of uh, economic theories of discrimination. Oh, wow. And um, a lot of the, uh, the analysis there was devoted to thinking about the arguments that, that Becker had made. And, yeah. uh, and 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 I was attempting with I don't know I don't know if I was successful or not but right. I was I was quite critical yeah of his, of his approach. So you know the the George Box quote uh, all, all models are wrong but some are useful. I was curious uh, what do you think is uh, useful about this traditional uh, work that economists have done on discrimination and what do you think is useless? Well, I think that there's something that's uh, of, of core use in, in traditional economics that extends into the work that I've tried to do in stratification economics, which is the, um, the importance of, of trying to think about whether or not the actions that people take have a rational basis. Right. You know, whether or not the actions that they take have an explanation that is consistent with saying that they are acting out of self-interest. Mm. And so uh, that's, that's, that's a dimension of conventional economics that I fully embrace and, uh, and, and carry into the work that I've tried to do in stratification economics. Uh, you know, it's, it's very conventional for people to say that uh, low-income whites in the United States are voting against their own self-interest. Right. Well, uh, in, in stratification economics, that's a proposition that doesn't make very much sense. Right. And so one of the things I've attempted to do is to explore ways in which you could say, well, no, in fact, uh, you know, whether or not you, you like the actions that they're taking, uh, they are acting out of their, their sense of self-interest. And, uh, you know, it's paternalistic to say otherwise. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, the, so, so where do you feel like the, the value of work like statistical discrimination or taste-based discrimination, where, what's the limits of where that is valuable in 2022 as, as, as like a policy or. Well, I mean, the difficulty, the difficulty I have with both of those approaches and, and Becker's is the taste for discrimination approach, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe Eigner and Kane or the were the major proponents of the uh, statistical approach. But the, the problem I have with both of those approaches is that they do not demonstrate that discrimination can be a sustained process. Yeah. Uh, the the I, whether whether you take uh, the the taste the taste approach to discrimination or the statistical approach to discrimination, it's very difficult to, to, to make the claim that these are permanent or persistent states of affairs right. under competitive conditions right. in conventional right. economics. Yeah. And so that's part of the motivation for trying to rework the thing, yeah. to think about discrimination in a different context and to advance uh, an approach to discrimination out of stratification economics, which... Yeah. Uh, you know, could establish that, you know, for better or worse, discrimination could be a stable state of affairs. Yeah, yeah. Well, so can you sort of say for people that are listening, how um, what, what is sort of the, the the unique features of stratification economics? Yeah, uh, stratification economics uh, arises in the work that I've done from thinking about. Uh, one of the central findings from happiness studies. Mm. So, uh, you know, typically economists have said, well, you're, you, you feel like you're better off if you have more of everything or you have more of some things and no less of others. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so it's your absolute position that dictates your degree of satisfaction or happiness. 
But the empirical happiness studies actually actually demonstrate that people don't necessarily feel better about having more of things. Mm. They feel better if they have more of things than other people. Yeah. So right. it's their relative position that matters. Right. And so that leads you on the path of thinking about what's the reference group or the peer group that people are comparing their own position against. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the big step, though, in, in stratification economics is to say that uh, one of the key peer groups is uh, which racial or ethnic group or gender group you identify with. So what's your group affiliation? What's the affinity group for you? Yeah. And that's what influences not only your thinking about how well you personally are doing, vis-a-vis yeah. -vis other members of your group yeah but you also can be very concerned about how your group collectively is doing in contrast with others uh, that are perceived as rivals or competitors uh and so social group identity becomes a component of the assessment of your relative status huh so you have preferences over your own relative consumption, but you also have preferences over some average consumption of relative consumption of your, your, your social you know, group. Identified right. group. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so do you think that, so it's funny when, so this is a, I actually took these out of the notes, the interview notes, because I didn't know we were going to go here, but um, you know, I, I have such a complicated uh, connection with that. It's like as a, scientific theory it's i think it's really interesting but like when i apply well i don't know how to apply any of this in a normative sense to my own personal life because when i think about how much dissatisfaction or unhappiness that i feel sometimes uh when i compare myself to other people it's profound you know it's like uh uh you know especially we've had health problems with one of our children. And, uh, you know, you, you can look at other people that are happy and it can just be, it can be brutal and toxic even. And so like, I'll go to, uh, sometimes I have trouble going to church now because, uh, in the church that I've traditionally gone to, there's so much joyous, uh, expression and, and our life has been really hard for five years. And so, but I think to myself, well, that's, that I have got to get a handle on that because uh, that's that that's harm in me. And uh, but then when I when I when I go into the literature and I read about, you know, like utility having something to do with relative consumption and reference points, all I ever think is how much that has been destructive in my life to to think that way. And I was just curious, like, yeah. how are you, how does all this fit together? in one's own as an understand as a real world understanding of inequality in the world and a kind of naivety that can come from not taking it seriously, but then also ways that it can get captured by a broken personal life, you know, in, in a way mm -hmm. that's not helpful. So, uh I mean, that that's, that's really a, a powerful testament actually to, the kinds of issues that are raised if you if you work through a stratification economics lens. Um, you know, my objective in thinking about these uh, these 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 issues in this particular way is to try to provide an alternative explanation for inequality or stratification from the one that says, well, it's all due to uh, a question of whether or not you have more or less human capital. Right, right. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the whole issue of uh, which social group you are affiliated with, whether by self-assignment or by external assignment, and that's, that's an important distinction, uh, influences what your position will be in the social order. Mm. Um, and so this this kind of uh, group based preference, particularly when it's exercised by individuals who are in the group that's in a dominant position, yeah, is extremely destructive. I mean, this is what 
produces uh, the the types of disparities that that I, I think that most of us view as as really really disturbing mm. and uh, and perhaps immoral. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, but it arises out of this type of preference scheme. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, and what's really important is uh, the degree of intensity with which you identify with your uh, your social group. Yeah. And uh, this could be uh, and and uh, from an aggressive standpoint, from the point of view of the group that is on top and wants to stay on top and may want to expand the distance between itself and other groups mm. versus uh, versus the groups that are in uh, a more bottom tiered position who may have very strong group attachments as a defensive mechanism right. against the circumstances that they're faced with. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Because it is an effective strategy. Is that the is the group? Well, I mean, particularly like- if if your group is in danger from the police or the criminal right. justice system or yeah. terrorist attacks from the dominant right. group, uh, it's important that you bond with the others in your group just for uh, out of a sense of self protection. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. It's so, in so in you know it's, it's 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 you're in the group that's disadvantaged. It certainly is not economically useful for you necessarily to stay aligned with the group that's at the bottom. Yeah. But it may be useful from the standpoint of of sheer survival. Right, right, right. Well, so uh so so that that's what I was kind of wondering. So I was I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, like as a white male, a young white male in the South in Texas, there's almost like some luxury I have in trying to entertain the possibility of not having a group identity because I might not lose a lot. You right. know? And, 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 and I think many people who, uh, you know, would even self-describe themselves as being white don't really think about whiteness. I don't. At all. Time, right? I was going to put that. I had that in the thing. Yeah, I don't right. even know they they don't think about it all the time. There, there has to be some circumstances that activate them, right? Thinking about it, yeah, yeah because yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 normative from their perspective that right. they, that, yeah, 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 so, yeah, so so, but but I guess like I still kind of think about things in this like. You know, when, when you kind of go through, everybody responds to hardship in their life in different ways. And, and you know, I've responded with this kind of uh, uh, a particular type of spirituality. And so I, I've thought to myself, I've got to stop comparing myself to other people. You know, as we both kind of know, economics is just almost poisonous with uh, professional, uh, you know, one upmanship type of, you know, Vita Vita jealousy and things like that, and citation but, count. Yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. just going. Yeah. Did, on did you and, place your article in a top yeah. ten journal? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. That, that yeah. all that top five stuff is. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it, it's interesting that economists don't pay that much attention to uh, the importance of relative position. Oh, I, I completely agree. You uh, know, there, in, there's in there's like a last even there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there's almost like a intrinsic. I've always kind of felt like it's I'm almost not surprised. There's almost like, you know, no guidance from the professional organization as to what values we should be sort of internalizing, because it's just this like, you know, the mar- the, the free hand will will the free the you know, the invisible hand will guide all values in each of these departments such that, you know, we've maximized some social function. And it's like the exact opposite in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> what has actually happened? But but I guess I was just kind of wondering what what do you when you think about you know uh, how, get when you think about the corrosiveness of of this kind of interpersonal comparison uh, and what it, if I heard you correctly the necessity of it as a natural survival mechanism what what exactly is the is the good path for uh, different types of people in their life as they kind of navigate uh, an oppressive s- 
set of situations in their life, whether it's material or not? Well, I think we, we cannot expect the groups that are at the bottom to dispense with their sense of identity before the groups that are the top at the top do so. Right, right. Uh, and so there, there is this whole question, you know, if we think about, about stratification economics in the U.S. context and the context of U.S. race relations. Right. There is this whole question of, you know, who, who among the white group will defect from whiteness? Right. Right. Uh, and and that's uh, there's there's a, a paper of of mine that's forthcoming in a special issue of the Journal of Economic Literature on stratification mm-hmm. economics. Oh, okay. And one of the one of the issues that I try to examine is, you know, are there conditions in which people will withdraw from uh, a dominant social group, huh. and and what are the terms of withdrawal? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, there there's. Uh, <laughs> Stratification economics has lots and lots of potential applications, yeah. but yeah. one of the issue, areas in which I think it's, it's most usefully applied is in thinking about questions of uh, allegiance, identity, yeah. uh, and, 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 and political action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allegiance. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So, so th- this is a large part of social history. Then you think about like religious movements and things like that. The stratification economics is almost a general theory of of uh, of of some kind of living in society. Is it a is it also something to do with the competing over scarce resources a little bit? Is there something about about people? fighting for these groups are endogenous and this group, the psychological connection with a group is endogenous to the fact that there's just not enough to go around, or at least we don't believe there is. Well, I think the, the last thing that you said is really yeah. the critical one that we don't believe there don't is. Believe so, yeah. I think that the, the perception of scarcity is a factor that might lead in this direction. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's almost as if, um, you know, dominant social groups are, are mercantilist in terms of thinking that the world is one in which everything is a zero sum game. Right, right. And so if uh, another group has some some form of advance or progress, it must mean that your group is 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 losing ground. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think that, that that definitely comes into play. Um, one of the other things that uh, I talk about in the forthcoming paper is, very briefly, is the phenomenon of the last place aversion. The last so, place aversion. Wow. So, so yeah. even, even if, uh, even if you, you may have some receptiveness to a change in your relative position, uh-huh. you want to be sure you're not at the bottom. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. You don't want to be last. Don't want to be last. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like the opposite of that shelling uh, thing where nobody wants to be on the front row. So then the front, so then the, <laughs> the, the first four rows of any auditorium is completely empty. Or empty. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody wants to be on, but being in the last place is a little bit different because, uh, uh, you can only not be in in the last place by fighting for the second to last place. So, right. so that right. one's probably going to be a little bit more uh, has potential for contention for sure. Well, it's interesting because as you say all that, all I think about is that economics has a lot to offer because of our belief that uh, you know various ways of working together can expand the the possibilities, but. It seems like in economics, the view is that this kind of happens naturally. Mm. Um, you know, is, is that there doesn't need to be any worry that it won't just kind of work out. You know, I always think about Stigler. Stigler's, you know, this is like a charitable way of putting it. Stigler's optimism about the historical <laughs> processes is, you know, uh, like c- cannot be touched. You know, like if you're observing it, it is efficient. Like, that, that's almost like what he... It, it, it's, a, it's like a Stigler theorem. Like if I'm seeing it, it's a good, it, it had to be good. Cause if it wasn't, it w- I wouldn't be seeing it. It wouldn't but, be uh, seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. 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 But I mean, um, uh, I, I was curious, what, what's your reaction when I say something like that? The, the fact well, that I, economics has that, 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 that view of possibilities being expanded, but 
but kind of our overall maybe a tendency to believe it'll be kind of natural. Well, I think one of the issues is what what do we think is economics, right? Uh, and and to the extent that there are actually multiple traditions, even though those multiple traditions are not typically taught to our students, right? Uh, I think that there are other traditions that really are uh, very open to thinking about much more creative ways in which our world could be could be shaped and organized. Um, uh, there's there's another paper of mine uh, that I hope will appear in the Journal of Economic Education. I'm not sure if it will, but I hope it will. And it's based upon the association lecture I gave to the Southern Economic Association in January. Mm. And uh, No, I'm sorry. I gave that lecture in November, uh, okay. November 2021. And, um, and I argue that uh, the, the scarcity principle is actually a problem, mm. that it's an obstacle to the ways in which we think about the world, and we don't have to use it as the cornerstone for economic analysis. And I propose two other, uh, uh, two other cornerstones. One is uh, uncertainty in Keynes's sense. Mm. And the other is inequality in the sense that Amartya's sin has a, has explored it. Mm. And I was thinking you could you you could you could easily build alternative approaches in economics from starting by saying that the core human condition is is one of uh, of of uncertainty, subjective, deep subjective uncertainty about the future, or by saying that the core economic condition is a, a long history of inequality. Mm. Uh, and then if you go from there, uh, you begin to, to have a, a very different orientation in terms of the kinds of questions that you, you would be inclined to ask and the ideas that you might generate. Has that been in your life kind of the emerging uh, principles that you keep going back to that have always been you've you've sort of you've sort of not been as drawn to scarcity being the starting point. You're right. I mean, in every definition of economics, you have that Lionel Robbins quote about right <laughs> what economics is the study of scarce. I mean, I use it too because I always think to myself, well, there's not a we, we live on a earth with finite resources and we have to try to maximize the well-being of its inhabitants. But yeah. but. Uh, I'm but but there's about. two there's there's two components to the concept though. One component is the available resources, mm -hmm. but the second component is the degree of desire that we have for the products of those resources. Mm -hmm. And so you could conceive of a society where people had wants that fit within the boundaries of what's available. Right. Right. Uh, right. The, the, the premise behind scarcity is that wants are unlimited. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But the, but that's a that's a product of certain social conditions. You know, yeah. it's a product of being in a society where advertising encourages you always to want more right. of being in a society where if you walk down the aisle in a grocery store right. uh, where where cereals are being sold. Uh, right. that there's almost an infinity of varieties yeah. to choose from. Right. Uh, th th these are all, these are all uh, scarcity is socially constructed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, I, I mean, I guess we could imagine a world in which there were infinite resources, depending on the technology of, uh, that, that, that we have access to. But, uh, but I think it's, it's more reasonable to think about uh, scarcity as a social construct as a consequence of the fact that uh, the notion that wants are unlimited yeah, right. is actually something that's very specific to particular types of, uh, that, that's, of community. That's how I teach it, too. It's interesting that you say that. I mean, in one sense... If, if you think of scarcity as finite material matter, right. Yeah. Then there's like, clearly it's not infinite because it's, there's a, there's a limit to the actual physical atoms or whatever, but it's clear economists. Don't well, un un unless, unless we have access to uh, the mineral wealth on other planets. And, yeah, exactly. and of course, right. it's, some, of it's, course like it's only, only, yeah, it's only wealth in, in terms of our own standards. Right. Of, right. of, of the usefulness of these yeah, things yeah but it, it's clear like that you're right like when we when we do talk about scarcity it, it immediately is followed with 
unlimited desires. And it's like unlimited desires is what literally makes something go from plenty to not enough. Not for you. And, no. and so I yeah. was thinking to myself, uh, you know, this is again, you know, the, the, I'm not Buddhist, but the, the Buddha says that the source of suffering is, isn't it desire or something like yeah. that? It's yeah. something like that. And I've always yeah. been really, I've always had a really difficult time with that teaching because I was an economist. I was so in the dyed in the wool, you know, as being an economist, all I kept thinking was, well, utility maximization is a normative thing. It's not just positive. I think it's the best thing. I think we should be trying to maximize utility. It's just a matter of what those preferences are. But over time, I've been just thinking it has been really, it, well, whatever that means to have preferences over things, there is a version of it that has not been particularly helpful in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess I wanted to to just kind of throw this out there. You know, when you talk to people in the classical liberal tradition, they'll kind of present. Now, none of this is like, you know, care. not all of this is like carefully well-identified causal effects. So it's more like a part of a narrative that's become very popular, which is like, well, the profit motive, though, has caused uh, an incredible change in the standards of living. Historically, we've got drops in child mortality. We've got increases in literacy. So they'll kind of like, just kind of like check off a bunch of stuff, you know, and they'll just mm -hmm. say like mm -hmm. the profit motive has been the responsible for research and development, technological breakthroughs. And, and I don't know ever really what to say to that because I feel like on a micro level, I completely feel that there is this, this issue about uh, contentment that does not get introduced into economics, which seems to be essential for inequality and, and these things, at least at the top end, you know, and yeah, yeah. But, but, um, but I was curious, like, what is your reaction to hearing someone say that, well, the profit motive is really important for, uh, addressing inequality, maybe not addressing inequality, but addressing absolute consumption by creating more so so is this is this say the same as i mean I, it's it's tricky because the the profit motive has a long long history uh-huh but it's not coterminous with the history of capitalism yeah in I which the profit yeah. motive is is highly animated but uh, you you've had you know uh You've had money lending from time immemorial before capitalism as a social system existed, and that's that's predicated on the the profit motive. You've had long distance trade where people attempt to buy something low and sell it high, right. and that motivated by the profit uh, the profit incentive. So, so I'm I'm not sure. I mean, we had we've had the profit motive for a long long time without having significant economic development. Right. Now, if the argument is that when the profit motive operates through a system in which we have uh, two great social classes, labor and, and, and capital, uh, and that's been associated with a variety of forms of economic development, uh, I think that's, that's indisputable. Uh -huh. But it's also been associated with a, a variety of negatives. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, um, so, you know, for uh, for every expansion in GDP, we also have destruction of the environment. Uh, right, right. Uh, and so, um, uh, and, 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 the, and the entire system is predicated on, on a, a fundamental class inequality in terms right. of who produces the social surplus versus who yeah. appropriates it and controls its use. So yeah, it, it seems like a lot of public policy that comes out of like, you know, the, the, or the neoclassical orthodox, however you want to say mainstream economics, 20th century. It, it's interesting. It's like, you know, pollution, for instance, it's inefficient or market power. It's inefficient. It's like, it's the efficiency normative concept and the idea of equality or yeah, like equality I don't feel like in my training, maybe we learned it and I just wasn't, 
you know, paying attention. I mean, I was always barely keeping up in my classes. So there's probably a lot of stuff I just did don't remember, but um, it doesn't feel, it feels like efficiency is the, the framework for addressing those problems of capitalism, but it seems like stratification economics also addresses those problems, but in a completely different, in a very different way. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. What, what would you, how would I articulate where, where that, you know, that tension is between us both agreeing on something like pollution or us both agreeing on, um, you know, uh, imperfect labor markets, monopsony. We both agree, but I'm not a stratification economist. What what exactly is the difference between us? I, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. So this, uh, is, this is a, this is a reach on my part. Uh, I mean, but but my thinking is that since stratification economics uh is 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 predicated on the view that people are concerned about group affiliation group identity and the success of their group relative to others that that's the separation point with uh, in terms of the context in which we might understand monopsony monopsony power right or uh, or other circumstances and that's that's what separates stratification economics uh from other approaches because <laughs> You know, in stratification economics, we're really trying to understand why there are uh, significant and sustained differences in life outcomes across social groups. Mm. And and so uh, it may be that uh, uh, there is monopsony power oh, in the world right. that's being exercised, but it's 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 going to be exercised disproportionately by members of Group A versus Group B. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So it's not necessarily even going to be challenging or offering or like suggesting an alternative theory of the firm. It's sort of motivated by group level differences in fairly important life circumstances like mortality mm -hmm. and, and persistent wealth gaps and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, who, who owns the firms? Right. And who decides what the firms do? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Right. Well, I don't want to lose track of this because I, this is I really am loving us uh, getting to know each other or me getting to know you better. But um, uh, this 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 new book that you have with um, uh, Kirsten Mullen on uh, African-American reparate. Well, it, that, that, that discusses uh, in it reparate. Well, it's called reparations for black Americans in the 21st century. So I was curious. Um, uh, if you could tell me a little bit about the 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 sorts of things in this book that um, that 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 we that have not that if you could tell me a little bit about reparations uh, and what the argument of the book is. Yeah, the, the, the core argument of the book is that um, black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States never have been given the material conditions for full citizenship in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's what a program of reparations must do, uh, is, is provide those kinds of resources. And, and to do that, we argue uh, it, would, it would require, at minimum, elimination of the racial wealth gap by building Black assets to the same average level of assets that are held by white, right. white households or white Americans. Um, and so uh, that's that's the central point of the book. We we argue it's only that gonna the, get big, it's only going to get bigger. Well, uh, yeah, the, longer, because, the longer you wait, the the larger the bill gets. Yeah, that's because right. of compounding interest, it's just going to get yeah. it's going to yeah. get really large. Uh, yeah. So so do you, in the book, what is the what are sort of the estimates of the size of the gap, and yeah. uh, that, that would require these kind? It, it would be transfer programs. Is that right? Well. Uh, it depends on how you interpret transfer programs. I mean, we actually argue in the book that you could fund a reparations plan without raising taxes. Mm. So there is a redistribution that is taking place, but it would not be a redistribution necessarily via transfers of funds from, uh, from, from one set of individuals' pockets to another set of individuals' pockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
yeah you know it's um, funny like i didn't mean to, but i was just thinking one of the, i've been one i've been sort of trying to figure out well what are the testable falsifiable predictions that come out of stratification economics and i was thinking to myself after we were talking if group identity is endogenous to that threatened position it almost seems like reparations or or you know elimination of wealth gaps at the personal level or the group level almost is extremely hard to do yeah well yeah it's i'm sure it's yeah, I'm it's sure. extremely hard to do given uh given the oh, right. uh, the preferences that are associated <laughs> with yeah. uh, with stratification economics yeah but i was yeah. also wondering is it also hard to do because as in among people where the gap might close so it's like amongst higher educated people or entrepreneurs or successful businessmen then they're not threatened anymore. And the group identity could even weaken at that point where gaps start to close. Is that is that a possibility that well it's it's actually it's actually not the case that, that gaps close at the upper end of the distribution. Okay. So so, so for example, uh, one quarter of white households have a net worth in excess of one million dollars, and it's only true for four percent of black households. Yeah, sure. Uh, like, so there, there, there really is not a convergence at the upper end. Uh, there's there's no convergence anywhere along the wealth distribution. But wouldn't it but, be true for that four percent, like for a member of that four percent, like extremely wealthy people like, you know, Kanye West just passed a billion and you're watching him. I, I mean, you know, it's anecdotally, but his. His public statements seem so different from his public statements at the beginning of his career before he was wealthy. And I, it's almost like he, well, like, well, we, like we, we, we don't, we don't know if that's just because there are certain uh, yeah. psychological problems I that know. Kanye West I know. I know. personally I know. has. But yeah, right. Yeah. right. Right. But, uh, but yeah, there's another way to think about it though, uh, which is that the folks at the upper end of the distribution who are white, are so much wealthier than everybody else yeah, yeah, yeah. that right. they would not be necessarily opposed to reparations. Right. Right. Because it, it their, relative, their personal relative position is not going to be affected very much. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it, it may be the case that the folks who are the most well positioned will be the more open or receptive to uh to a reparations plan, but I, yeah. I'm not sure that's the case. Right? That's just right. well, the marginal okay. utility of consumption is space sending spaceships into space is probably pretty small. <laughs> Elon <laughs> Musk. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm gonna only be able to send out ten spaceships this year instead of twelve. <laughs> uh, well, it's really not. It's really nice to finally meet you. I've followed your work ever since I was in graduate school. I wrote on. Uh, mass incarceration amongst African American men and uh, its impact on marriage markets. And I I remember yeah. uh, reading some of your work uh, early on. And I you know since then I've learned more of your work and I was have has been really uh, benefited from it. And I've really benefited from this conversation thinking about these things. Um, uh, I'm sorry about your team. Those were 15 brutal points, right? That was, uh, or 12 or 15. Uh, well, yeah, no, they were up by 15 at the half and they, they lost the lead, but yeah, you know, I, I can't complain. I mean, yeah. they went farther than anybody had really anticipated. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I, 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 I do want to say that the work that I did on marriage markets and, um, and and uh, disproportionate female headship in, in in the black community is work that I did in conjunction primarily with Samuel Myers Jr. and then yeah. more recently also with Terry Ann Craigie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing I'd like to mention is you you asked about the cost of a reparations plan. You yeah. know what? Yeah. And so uh, based upon the 2019 survey of consumer finances, it's estimated that the average black household has about $842,000 less in net worth than the average white household. 
Mm-hmm. And if you were to treat that as a on a per person basis, it would come to approximately three hundred fifty thousand dollars as a gap between per uh, as a gap between uh, uh, an average gap between blacks and whites in the United States. It's and so, if you're yeah. going to if you're going to directly eliminate that differential, it would cost uh, at least fourteen trillion dollars. Okay, it, it seems like would it be uh, um, uh, since it's a wealth gap, is it a transfer of capital more than like income? I mean, I actually haven't. Thought, so it it, so it, it depends. How. It depends upon how you want to make the uh, make the payments, the direct payments to the eligible recipients, and you could do it with less liquid assets than a cash transfer. Uh, uh, you could do it by setting up trust accounts, annuities, right. various kinds of endowments, or you could do it with a combination of those things. Right. Uh, but but what's what's critical in our our study is the, is the uh, we take the position that the eligible recipients should have complete discretion over the use of the funds. Yeah. Sure. Okay. That's what I was. That's what I, yeah. That that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, of trusting people to decide uh, what they do with lump sum transfers is usually utility, you know, has. Uh, yeah, I mean, conventional economics says conventional that's economics the best way to do it. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to to talk to you, Dr. Darity. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, it's uh, I hope we get to talk again uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks so much for talking with me. Okay. Cheers.